service. And as you're, uh, you are generously giving back to God what he has given to you, I just want to just take a moment to introduce an unexpected special speaker this morning. Um, you know, God knows what's coming up. And uh, Bill called um, earlier in the week and he said, hey, you know, is there a room available at the Cotton Inn? for me to stay for a couple of days. And uh, we have, as we always do, said, certainly, come on and let's, let's enjoy some fellowship time together. So he did. Well, God knew that my husband was not going to be well. <coughs> and so he uh, brought Bill, who is able to take um, the word of God. He had something brewing in his own heart, but he also was able to just take the, co the completion of this God's Top Ten series that we have been uh, going through. And so I am really excited. He is not new to our platform, but Bill, come on up. We're excited that he is going to have the opportunity to share the last of this series. And thanks very much. Be anointed. Good morning, everyone. Morning. I should explain my audacity of wearing an Oregon Ducks shirt to say. I wore Oregon Ducks up here when we were mighty and we were squishing the lowly Huskies. And now I, I'm wearing it in humility, <laughs> acquiescing to the greatness of Washington teams, both of them actually, over the lowly Ducks and Beavers, who Don't both sure. have not done well. <laughs> it is indeed, uh, in fact, I have to tell you, I was a little intimidated. Uh, I'm usually not nervous about speaking. I've done a lot of it in uh, other kinds of forums. And, but when you get to the top of the Ten Commandments, the top two, these, these are you know, number one and number two. The countdown is building to this place. And when I, st I thought, oh, yeah, I, I, I can talk about those with my eyes closed. And, but, the, but the reality was as I began to prepare my heart in the few hours that Pastor Doug gave me. By the way, Lo Lois was sick as a dog yesterday. I hope you know that. She is a warrior being here this morning and up here. I was surprised that, that she came because yesterday she was not uh, looking like she was going <laughs> to get anywhere but the uh, restroom. And um, <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> you know, the throwing up kind of thing. Well, anyway, <laughs> I want to, as we, as we get into these uh, these number two and number one commandments. I'm kind of combining them in a sense because I think God does. I was reminded of a story of that just kind of illustrates how critical an, an understanding of the commandments can be. I was, I had a secretary who had worked for me for about six months. She was a very bright, capable lady. In fact, when she interviewed for the job, she told me, I can do the work of five people and still have a clean desk at the end of the day. Well, that would be great if she could actually do that. You know, I guess. And, and you know what? I, after long discussions, I hired her. And she was very professional, very businesslike, very efficient. And she indeed did more work. Than, I couldn't keep her busy. And I had lots to do. And she was amazing. Well, we never talked about religion. It was all business at the office. And one day, out of nowhere, the subject of religion came up. And she just offered. I was stand, She was sitting at her desk here. I was standing over looking out the window. And she said, well, I'm an agnostic. And I, I, I did something. I responded in a way I had never before. And I am sure to this day it was the Lord even prophetically speaking to her. I turned around and I said, no, you're not. You're not an agnostic. You're someone so hungry for God, so hungry for the real thing, that you've rejected all the empty religion and ritualistic or legalistic things you've seen, not because you're rejecting God, but because you want him and you don't want any substitute. You want the real thing. Yeah. This very professional business lady burst into tears, sitting at her desk, just tears running down her face, sobbing. 
at, at what I had just said as the Lord had just used me to tell her what he wanted to say to her. And she said, <laughs> but, 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 but what, what about the Sabbath? <laughs> Where in the world did that come from? What about the, I'm an agnostic, but, but what about the Sabbath? And I said to her, I said, well, the Ten Commandments are all repeated in the New Testament, except one. There's one we're not commanded to keep, and that's the Sabbath. And she kind of looked cheered up by what I just said. I said, but it's not, because, it's not repeated not because it's not important, but in fact, it's in a way the most important of all. Because it is the message of the New Testament. The message of the New Testament is no longer do you have to work to please God. You have to trust in his grace and his mercy and just believe. The works of God are that you believe. And, and then she said, I said, it's not one day a week now, it's seven days a week. The Sabbath is now, the rest that we enter into is seven days a week, not one. We cease from our own labors knowing that we can never perfectly keep the law of God and we trust in his grace and mercy. And her face lit up and she told me then that she'd been raised in a religion where the, uh, the Sabbath was the, what it was all about and that uh, the legalism of that and all that she'd been, she had, had, by the time she was 13, she had was fed up with it, had had it and she walked away from God and wanted nothing to more to do with Christianity ever again until the day the Lord spoke to her and told her, no, it's only because you're looking for the real thing. So what we believe about and understand about these truths are really important. Now, the second commandment, when you read the second commandment, just to make it simple, it says that you are not to have any graven images or idols. And the typical way that we speak about that is we say, well, you're not to have idols like money or sports or hunting or sex or anything in your life that would be more important than God. And, and in a sense, that is true, in a sense. But I don't believe that's really what the second commandment is about. The second commandment says not to make any graven image of God or you're not to make an image of God. And this is a really big deal to God. Uh, in fact, he follows up with some pretty strong words about jealousy, about he's a jealous God, and that he doesn't want us with some other God or image of God. How is that relevant to you and I? How many of you have, no, you don't have to raise your hand, how many of you have a stone idol at home in your closet where no one can see that you go home and when no one's looking, you bow down and you worship it? I'm glad I see no hands. <laughs> <laughs> you say, well, then, that, what, then how is that commandment important to me? How does it affect my life? Now, can you put up Isaiah 44? Isaiah 44 is a, uh, a passage that talks about idols in the sense, it's a fairly long, I'll read it fast if you want to follow with me. How foolish are those who manufacture idols? These prized objects are really worthless. The people who worship idols don't know this, so they are all put to shame. Who but a fool would make his own god, an idol that cannot help him one bit? All who worship idols will be disgraced along with all these craftsmen, mere humans who claim they can make a god. They may all stand together, but they will stand in terror and shame. The blacksmith stands at his forge to make a sharp tool, pounding and shaping it with all of his might. His work makes him hungry and weak. It makes him thirsty and faint. Then the woodcarver measures a block of wood and draws a pattern on it. He works with chisel and, and, and plane and carves it into a human figure. He gives it human beauty and puts it in a little shrine. He cuts down cedars. He selects the cypress and the oak. He plants the pine in the forest to be nourished by the rain. Then he uses part of the wood to make a fire so he can cook his food or be warm. 
He warms himself and bakes his bread. Then, yes, it's true, he takes the rest of it and makes himself a god to worship. He makes an idol and bows down in front of it. He burns part of the tree to roast his meat and to keep himself warm. He says, ah, oh, that fire feels good. Then he takes what's left and makes his god a carved idol. He falls down in front of it, worshiping and praying to it. Rescue me, he says, you are my god. Now, obviously, God is mocking the concept of going to the trouble of making a God that you create with your own hands and you fall down in front of it and worship it. How does that relate to us? It's the making of this thing that is troubling God, that you make it, then you fall down and worship it. It is because all of us do the same thing. All of us have in our minds an image of God. And often, that image is one that we have designed, that we have shaped. And uh, let, me, let me give you an example. How many of you ever said, you know, I know I'm not God, but if I were, frankly, there wouldn't be any hell. Have you ever thought that? that you know, or if there was, if I was God, my next door neighbor, who's a really nice guy and helps me out when I need help and uh, he just doesn't believe in Jesus. There's no way he would perish. You know, if I was God, I, don't, I wouldn't have made man with free will, knowing that there would be people that would rape and murder and torture and commit genocide and, and steal and plunder and hurt little children. I would never have done that because, I, I, in fact, I would intervene and I would stop that serial killer. I would stop, you know, you, or I would have killed Hitler in the cradle. You know? Because it is, it is a tendency we all have to forget who is God and who's not. And we, we shape in our own minds the kind of God we would like for him to be. And we reject things that violate that or contradict that. Now, in Isaiah 53, this, the, the famous prophecy about the coming of the Messiah, I won't read the whole thing, but there's a, in verse 2, it says, for he shall grow up before him as a tender plant. This is talking about Jesus growing up, but growing up before the Father as a tender plant, and as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness. And we see, when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. So here's God sending his son into the world. You know, one of the primary reasons Jesus came into the world was to show us what God was really like. Now, at the time he came, people, the, 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 the Jews had a concept of God. Some of them were probably fairly accurate, but the ruling leaders of Judaism were the opposite. The Sadducees didn't believe in miracles or the miraculous or the resurrection. They were fairly minor sect compared to the Pharisees who were dominating for the most part. And, the, and, the, and the, they were all about laws and rules. And, and they forgot the weightier things of the law, such as having mercy and compassion and forgiveness. And they were about do this, do this, do this, and tithe on every little mint leaf you get. 10% goes to God and, and do all these things. But they swallow camels straining at gnats and swallowing camels and missing God completely so that when Jesus came and he showed them what God was really like, they hated him because their image of God was all wrong. They missed God because he did not fit what they had preconceived in their own minds as what God was really like. So when Jesus came, you know, you'd think that God would make him very handsome. And usually in movies they... A lot of times in movies they try to get some really handsome guy, especially somebody with eyes that are so piercing that when you look into him, you go, oh, <laughs> that must be the son of God. He, but, but, you know, the reality is that he came with no beauty that we would desire him. In fact, pe theologians sometimes theorize that the reason he was able to escape into the crowd when they were going to stone him and he just kind of walked away was because he looked so nondescript that nobody even paid any attention to what he looked like. And he didn't go around with a halo around his head. Even though he was the son of God. 
But, he, but God purposefully made him so that looking at him, you would not say that's the son of God. But the way he acted, the way he treated people, showed us what God was really like. That included taking whips and driving money changers out of the temple in, in, in anger, without sinning. That included, included spending all day after being up all night in prayer, down healing the brokenhearted and the sick and, the, and just person after person and just showing us the heart of God, the compassion of God. And living perfectly, never sinning even once, showing us the holiness of God. And yet, we still today reject God in our own lives in ways that we don't realize. Now, I had a, I had a um, stepmother, my dad in Indiana. I talked to her about the Lord. She was in her 40s, I think, at the time. Smart gal. And I said, I told her about Jesus, and she said, I don't, I don't believe in God. I don't believe in God. And I said, but, but why? To me, it's all like self-evident that there's a God. How can you not believe in God? I mean, look around you. But to her, she said, no, I don't believe in God. Why don't you believe in God? She's, and she, and I, it was, it's hard to believe that, that she basically gave up her soul and her eternal destiny over this. But she said, well, I had a cat that I really loved. We were very close. You know, it would sit on my lap when I watched TV. And, and it, when I came home, it was all excited to see me. And I loved that cat. And one day, it, without my knowing it, it got outside and it got run over. And there is no way there is a God who, he could have stopped that from happening. He could have stopped my cat from being run over. If there was a God, he would never have let that happen. And if there, and if there was a God that let that, that happen, I don't want anything to do with him. And so her soul was continuing to live in the kingdom of darkness, still unacceptable to God because her cat died. Now, you take that story and you can see the perhaps triviality or vanity of such thinking, but people do it all the time. When someone they love gets cancer, a child dies. You lose your job in your house. If there was a God, this would not happen. One of the most difficult things in the world is to understand that God is a lot smarter than we are. I would never have given people free will because I am not wise enough to know to look down through history and see every event that's ever going to happen, every evil thing that's ever going to occur, and knowing it's going to happen, still give man free will, knowing what he was going to do with it. But knowing that in my purposes, there are going to be redeemed out of all those generations, millions and millions of people who are going to make heaven their home and are going to love God and hunger after God. And uh, that's, it's, it's beyond me. In Romans chapter 11, there's a verse that's in 11.22, and I'm not going to go to it other than to say that it talks about two things. Cons Therefore, consider the goodness, the goodness and severity of God at the same time. On those who fell, we're talking about the Jews who rejected Jesus, some of the Jews who rejected Jesus, but toward you, believers, goodness. If you continue in his goodness, otherwise you also will be cut off. Ooh. Now, that's a New Testament verse. You ever want to get yourself on a little journey that might violate some of your theological misconceptions? Do a word study on the word fear in the New Testament. Not the Old Testament. Everybody says in the Old Testament, lots of fear, you know, angry God, punishing people. But do a, do a study, a word study on the word fear in the New Testament. And you say, oh, I'm supposed to fear God I'm supposed to love God. I'm supposed to trust God. All at the same time. Uh huh. You are. Thomas Jefferson 
Everybody know who Thomas Jefferson was, one of the founding fathers, wrote the Declaration of Independence and all that? Do you know he had his own Bible? He created his own Bible. It was a red-letter edition Bible. Can you guess what was in it? <laughs> he went through the Bible, and the things that we would call the red letter were Jesus is talking, and he says beautiful things. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Oh, I like that. I put that in my Bible. And he, and he goes through, and he finds all the things that Jesus said that were lofty and love your neighbor, and, and it's good stuff. All true. Jesus said all this stuff. And that's all he had in his Bible. He didn't have all those things that are, you know, like, uh, I am the only way. No man comes to the Father except by me. He didn't have Paul's doctrines on salvation and, and uh, election, etc. He had his own Jesus, his own God, fashioned by selectively choosing what he would believe about God. Now, when I was in Bible college, Pastor Doug, Pastor Doug and I, this shows how old he is. <laughs> we were in Bible college together. One of the first things you learn about doctrine and theology is that any biblical doctrine must embrace, include everything the Bible says about that subject. Everything. Leaves nothing out. And if, you, if there is a verse in the Bible that doesn't fit into your doctrine, you don't take that verse and throw it out. You find out how to adjust your doctrine so that it actually embraces everything God says about the subject. Sometimes that's harder than you might think. Well, the world today, there are lots of people in the world today that would accept a lot of what Jesus said. But they just wouldn't accept other parts of what Jesus said. I'm going I'm to show you, this may not apply to you. I went to a conference in Portland several years ago. It was about 500 ministers. And the conference was, the subject of the conference was, what are we going to do about the cult explosion? At the time, there were a lot of Hare Krishnas. You know what those were? Little, you know, shaved head chant at the airport, ask for money. They uh, were in red robes. The Rajneeshis, everybody heard of the Rajneeshis in, in Oregon, the cult there, the thousands of them had a little sheep ranch, a 64,000 acre sheep ranch that they had this cult where they came in with an Eastern guru. Well, the, the, this, the, top, the topic of this conference is what are we going to do about all the youth and whatnot who are being caught up in these cults? And they had a guy named Harvey Cox, probably never heard of him. He was the head of the uh, theology department at Harvard University. They had panels of experts that were psychologists, sociologists, psychiatrists, all up there in front of us for two or three days talking about cults and blah, 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 and analyzing how human nature responds, all this stuff. And after the first day, the Baptist pastor who had invited me came. He and I were at lunch, and, and I said, at the, it was actually the middle of the second day. I said, um, I said, Joe, I kind of have the feeling that you and I are the only two Christians in that room. And he looked up at me and nodded. He said, I, I think you're right. Sadly, I think you're right. There were about 500 ministers there, literally. People actually had haircuts, which I rarely do. They had haircuts with, that were looked like they were done with the best barbers. They had the finest, you know, fat multi-thousand dollar suits on. And they looked very di dignified and sophisticated and had degree and degrees, PhDs, doctorates after their names. And had graduated, completed the best divinity schools or seminaries in the land, well, by their standards. But they were, they came almost exclusively from churches that don't believe that Jesus was really divine and the son of God in any different sense than Buddha or Confucius or Muhammad or any other great Gandhi or other leaders. They didn't believe the Bible was the inspired word of God. They didn't believe Jesus actually raised from the dead or died for our sins. But they, but they were the community a community of faith, they call themselves. But they didn't believe the Bible was the word of God. They just believed that... Uh, Christianity was, you know, 
a good thing to believe, sort of. And you know, do you know what they concluded about the cults at the end? Of what to do about the cult explosion with all these people getting confused by the Rajneeshis and the and the uh, uh, the Hare Krishnas and etc. They concluded at the end of three days of their greatest minds together contemplating this challenge. Who are we to decide that they will not find their way to God on the path they have chosen just as we have found him on ours? So what do they do about the cold explosion? Nothing. How do we know they're not as right as we are? Because the reality is, when you reject the word of God, the inspired word of God as the source of your truth, then you are free to create your own God. Yes. You can carve him, engrave him. You don't do it with stone or wood. You do it in your mind. And you create a God who fits what you believe is right and good. And he is perfectly fine, forgive me for being so bold, he's perfectly fine with premarital sex, he's perfectly fine with abortion, he's perfectly fine with homosexuality, he's perfectly fine with all the things, except for the one thing he doesn't like to them, is this exclusive, exclusivity and narrow-mindedness of saying that Jesus is the only way. Especially when the God of the Old Testament did all kinds of things that none of us would approve of today. But do you know, and, and this is a shocking revelation to some Christians today, do you know that the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament are the same? Do you know that the sweet and lowly Jesus that they think exclusively in that way was there in the Old Testament? He's all through it. He's everywhere in it. And God the Father did not do any harsh thing in the Old Testament that Jesus was not in perfect agreement with. Perfect agreement with. But it's, sometimes it's hard to understand that. We look at these things when it's hard to understand. There, I, I, yesterday I was studying to do this, and a thought came to my mind, a verse came to my mind. I, just don't, I, I don't know where it even, it just came out of nowhere, so... I'm going to say from the Lord. And it was, he, he is altogether lovely. Altogether lovely. I said, where, where is that? So I pulled out my phone. Siri. <laughs> <laughs> where does the Bible say that he is altogether lovely? And it took me to the Song of Solomon. And chapter 5, verse 16, translated a few different ways, but but. The best translation is that his mouth is most sweet. Yes, he is altogether lovely. This is my beloved. And this is my friend, O daughters of Jerusalem. This is a, an allegory. The, book, the Song of Solomon is a, <laughs> it's almost adult reading. <laughs> the Song of Solomon is a story of uh, a Shunammite maiden and presumably and her lover. Uh, and it's all about our relationship with Jesus in the most Love, loving way you can imagine. It's beautiful. It's glorious. And she, in, the, in this chapter, she is describing him. She's looking at him in every way, from every angle, talking about different parts of him. And her conclusion in this allegory that is about Jesus, that he is altogether lovely. All together. All together. That means there's no side of him that's flawed. In every way, he is perfect. Our God, in every way, is perfect. He makes no mistakes. James says that in him there is no darkness, neither shadow of turning. No matter which angle you look at God from, no matter what he's doing, no matter how it seems to you or I, he is altogether lovely and perfect. And the image that we have of God can only be shaped properly one way. I'm trying to shape it today. I am trying to shape your image of God. Fathers, the way you treat your kids, you are shaping their image of God. When you read your Bible and you are studying, you are shaping 
the image of God. And it is the only tool by which you can honestly, fairly, and safely shape your image of God. The Bible says it. I believe it. It's true. If it contradicts my understanding, okay, my understanding needs to be adjusted. But so when God says, make no graven images, he's saying, just don't make up your own. How do you think these guys that made these idols out of wood or stone, what did they do? They shaped him the way they perceived him. And when you shape or mold something, you are the creator. You are the great one. He, it is subject to your whim. And God, the real God, will not be subject to our whim. So when God says to us that he would put us first, have us put him first, you shall have no other gods before me, the first commandment, and you will make no graven images or idols. He is saying the most important thing you can do in all of your life is to know me. Put me first. Make me your highest priority. Love me. Yeah, but you know what? I love God. But if it came down to God or my kids, I'd pick my kids. You know what? That's a natural human response. It's wrong. Because it's only when you really love God and know God, and that is the filter of your heart through which your love for your children or your spouse or your family flows, that you can really love them to the ulti in the ultimate sense of the word. And when your heart is not li aligned with God, and you are not submitted to him and serving him and making him the highest priority in your life, then you are not fully capable. You may think you are, because that's all you know. We only know what we know. But you're not full of, fully capable of loving in the dimension and the sense and the fullness to, in, with which we can if God is first in our life. First commandment of all, there's just one God, and he's first in our lives. and No other gods before him. Do you know when he says that, I'm running out of time here. When he says that, do you know, if you read in the context of the first, in, in Exodus 20, when the first commandment is given, he says, you'll have no other gods before me. He doesn't even say there are no other gods. Isn't that, doesn't that seem strange to you? He, he's not saying there are no other gods. He's saying, I'm first. Why is that? Because there are other gods. They're, may, they're maybe not real. But they are real to you if you create them and you bow down to them and worship them. They are real to you. Therefore, they are gods. They, they, don't, they didn't create the earth. They, they don't have eyes that can see and ears that can hear and a mouth that can talk. And they can't help you. In fact, when they describe making them <coughs> in one, another chapter in Isaiah, it says, be careful. They were carefully make him so that he'll stand up and not fall down. What kind of God do you want? You have to carve his, his base so that he won't fall down. And then you pick him up and carry him wherever you go and set him down. And then you worship him. The, the vanity and foolishness, foolishness of that. Because the, there, there are other gods if we make other gods. And if we treat them like a god. As far as God is concerned, they are a god to us. But he says, there is only one God. I am he. I am first, and these other things that you create and make are all vanity. So this is the, this is the admonition that I would leave you with. There's a, I love this verse, Psalm 85, 10. Um, and it's, if, you, if you can meditate on this verse, it, it, do, we have that, do we have that up there? Psalm 85, 10. It, what it says is that righteousness... And let's see where have I got it here. Mercy and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed. This is one of the more beautiful verses in all of the Psalms. Right? Mercy and truth have met together. You know, mercy and truth are at odds. Because the truth is I don't deserve mercy. The truth is I am a sinner and I have offended God and I deserve judgment. That's the truth. But mercy has met truth. Mercy has met truth. And then righteousness and peace have kissed. 
That is what Jesus, that is what the true God has done. He has taken those things which are at odds and he has brought them together. And he is, they have kissed those which would be juxtaposed in opposition to one another have kissed in the Lord Jesus. The God who demands perfect holiness, be perfect even as I am perfect. Be perfect as God is perfect. You say, well, oh, man, Lord, I try. And sometimes I make it for five minutes <laughs> when I'm sleeping. <laughs> but, but the reality, he says be perfect, but he says, but I can make you perfect. I can impute perfectness. I can bestow it to you. And all you have to do is trust me and believe me. Oh, then the impossible has become impossible, has become possible in Jesus. The God I thought was my enemy, my judge, is my friend and the lover of my soul and my savior. So today, I'll leave you with this thought as I wind up here. They say I'm going to land the plane now. The, uh, the first two commandments are, in a sense, the most important ones. You know, when they're asking the New Testament, you know, what are the great commandments? He says, of course, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength, and the neighbor as thyself. And all the, other, all the commandments hang on these two things, right? That's, it all boils down to, God, I want to love you with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. And what I'm challenging you today is to understand that the only way you can do that is to submit your own notions of God to what the word of God says about him. Do not find a flaw in him when he is doing something you say think is audacious. Say, when I see him judging Jericho or the house of Achan and his household, when I see him steeping, stooping and telling the woman taken in adultery that you are uh, no, no man's judge, no man's here to cast a stone, no man's judging you. When he's healing the sick and healing the brokenhearted, when he's doing all of these things throughout the Bible, he is all together lovely. S say, say that with me together, if you would. He is all together lovely. That is what I would have you take away today from this humble attempt at a sermon that I'm sharing with you. He, my God, is altogether lovely. And I'm going to find him when I read the Bible. I'm going to find him everywhere. I'm going to learn about him. And I am going to submit my preconceptions to, preconceptions to him. And I am going to make him first. I tell my children this. In all of your doing, my son's in a cyber crime division in the Air Force. He's uh, in training down in Florida right now uh, for cyber crime. And he's got all these interests in life that he's going to. I, I remind him, the same as with my daughters. I say, son, in all of your things that you're busy with in your education, your family, your career, understand this. First, you must love God. Seek to know him and make doing his will the highest priority in your life. So today, uh, just for a moment, just have every head bowed. We never want to have a, a service where we don't offer opportunity. If you're here today and, and you don't know the Lord Jesus and you're still, uh, in a sense, an enemy of God because your sins are still binding you up and condemning you, if, if you would like today to know the Lord Jesus as your Savior and have all your sins forgiven and be right with God and, and have heaven as your future home, would you just raise your hand today so we can pray with you? Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Appreciate those hands. And uh, anybody else? Thank you. So let's just pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we thank you that you are perfect, that you are good. And Lord, that you have seen fit to come down and give yourself for us to wash us and cleanse us from our sins and, and make us whole and right and make us acceptable in your sight. 
Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask that these who have raised their hands, that you would today set them on that road and that they would come to know you like all of us are developing and growing in our understanding of you. And so uh, bless them, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name. If you raised your hand, uh, feel free, would you please come up and, uh, and maybe some prayer team come up and you can come up and they'll give you some literature and just help you get started in your life with the Lord. And, uh, you know, at the end of Paul's ministry in the book of Philippians, chapter 3, verse 10, I believe, he said his, his goal, his thing in life was, I want to know. Everyone, please stand. He says that I might, this is the Apostle Paul saying, that I might know him. The, the Paul who had been caught up to the third heaven, the Paul who had met Jesus on the road to Damascus and been knocked off his horse blinded and heard the Lord speak to him in person and it had written all these epistles and all the things Paul had done. He says at the end of his life, he's still praying that I might know him. I might know him because that is a lifelong proposition. Getting to know Jesus. How many of you know Jesus? How many of you know the Lord? Okay. You know what? We're just getting started. We'll spend all of eternity because there is so much to know about God. It's the revelation will continue forever, and the image of, that we have in our minds and hearts of God will only grow, and as it grows, we'll all say, He is altogether lovely. Thank you. God bless you.